Okay, you guys, super, super exciting to be sharing with you about Frozen episode two, which was my first real debut on Frozen. So really, really exciting to get to watch this. I'm gonna be talking in this about the things that we are seeing in this episode. And then I'm also gonna be giving you some of my backstory, some of the things that were happening during those six days shown on episode two that weren't shown in the episode. I'm also going to be talking about some general survival topics that are brought up by this episode, specifically canvas tarps versus plastic tarps. And and the advantages and disadvantage of each. I'm gonna be talking about that landscape and two of the major trees we're seeing there, larch, also known as tamarack, versus spruce. Also, there's some fir there. And then I'm also gonna be talking about my spot and the spots we're seeing other folks in and how those were similar and different. Reminder to please subscribe to my channel, hit the notifications bell if you want to hear when my videos come out, and please like this video and share it if you like what I do. Also, super exciting time to be joining my Patreon calls because we are doing live calls with Q&A about Frozen, the alone experience in general, and you get to ask me about things that you're seeing in the episodes that you're curious about. So consider joining me on Patreon if you like what I do and want to support me and being able to do more of it, and if you'd like more interaction than you're able to get from these YouTube videos. All right, so there we are getting launched. The last three folks that you didn't see in episode one, myself, Michelle, and Greg, and it was a rough launch day because the weather was so bad that they couldn't launch us until late in the day, which meant we basically lost a whole day of decent weather, which as you can see, if you are watching the show is a really big deal out there. There is not much good weather and it is like gold. So having lost that day was ugh, having to set up late at night without getting to scout the land very much and knowing that a storm was coming was definitely a big stressor and you hear everybody talking about that. We get to see some background information on Michelle. Now, Michelle had a real advantage out there because she's the only person who is from an environment similar to that and relatively close to that, relative because Labrador is way north of Maine, but she grew up coastal Maine. So she's used to the landscape a bit and a lot of the same resources. So this was a really sweet setup for Michelle in particular. I just adore Michelle. I was in Maine visiting family last summer, way before we knew that Alone Frozen was a possibility, and I got to hang out with Michelle in Maine, where she's from, which was really sweet, having no idea that we were about to share an adventure that was amazing together. I had a feeling of immediate kinship with Michelle. I just felt like this woman and I are supposed to be friends. There is more to our friendship than this one get together in Maine. And then within a month of that time, there comes the call for Frozen. So talk about serendipity, right? It shows me and my background. It shows me talking about my sweetheart, Taylor, and how it was a really different situation having someone to leave behind at home. Before I was single, while I had friends, my life was definitely more solitary. And so it was a much bigger deal for me to leave this time, particularly because I also have a online community that I've built my Patreon members and other folks who I interact with regularly. So I was leaving a business that was more established, leaving a partner and a life that it was more established, that was significantly different in ways that I didn't really fully appreciate when I left. What a difference it was to land, get off that helicopter and find an amazing resource within the first 10 minutes of being on the ground. That water bottle, being able to store water and to carry it around with me was unbelievably enormous. It's hard to really verbalize what a big deal that is if you haven't been in an extreme survival situation without the ability to carry water. And then to see mussels on the beach right away, right after that, food and water right away, I was like, okay, this is gonna be different and this is a very good sign. Really fun to see Greg at the beginning of the episode because Greg and I had just gotten off of a Zoom call together with my Patreon members. So we literally hung up the call and then both started watching the episode. So it was cool seeing each other's experience right after that. Again, launched right before dark, major, major handicap. And it was cool seeing Greg talk about what it is to be an older person going into alone and having a lot more experience. And he's also had more time since his first alone adventure. He was on season three. I was the next longest span and I was on season six. So three more years to integrate the lessons and really put things into practice. 
love that those prairie boots that I talked about in the last review are front and center on Greg. Now, I want to be clear that these were not issued gear. It wasn't like the Alone Show provided them. We just talked to the locals and everyone said, these are the boots you want. So every single one of us wore them out there. It was hilarious. Because they provide us with a tarp to keep the camera equipment dry, it never occurred to me to bring an additional tarp. And I remember in pre-launch knowing that both Amos and Greg were bringing them. And I was like, huh, that's an interesting choice I wouldn't have made. And let me tell you, as soon as we were on the ground and saw both that weather and the quality of those tarps we had, which you can see in this episode, mine was already full of holes by day three, I was like, dang, I wish it had occurred to me to bring a really nice tarp as one of my items. But hindsight, right? <laughs> you guys, when I crawled out of my shelter for my final pee before going to bed that first night and the sky was lit up with northern lights. It was so amazing. It just felt like that landscape was saying, welcome home, Wonia. We've got the lights on for you. We know you and we're glad you're here. Northern lights were a big part of my experience up in the Arctic. I live in California, Nevada. So I don't get the Northern Lights normally. So that was the first time I had seen them since my time in the Arctic. So not just seeing them out there in Labrador, but seeing them the very first night was just like, oh, this place has something special for me. Cool that Michelle also saw those Northern Lights. And we got to see her on day two, which was a beautiful day. I also had an awesome day two. I'll talk about that at the end in my backstory. You can really get a good feel for the landscape as Michelle is walking around and see how those trees out there are all small and twisted and stunted because that weather is so fierce on the coast. Nothing to break those storms as they rush all the way across the Atlantic and just blast the Labrador coast. So, so different than I was used to anywhere else I've ever been in terms of having really limited building material and the building material being short and twisted and really different shapes than most wood that you would want to choose for building. You can really see the contrast of Michelle, who's clearly in a sunny location that is south facing versus me. I'm pretty much in the shade every time you see me, similar to Callie being in a north facing location. Definitely a handicap. We hear Michelle talking about how high the tide is coming and hearing something and not realizing it was just the water on the shore because the water came up so high. This is an important point about coastal Atlantic Canada. New Brunswick has some of the highest tides in the entire world. Not the highest in the world in Labrador, but still big old tides. So lots of difference between the high tide line and the low tide line, such that even Michelle, who's from Maine, was surprised by it. If you ever get the opportunity to go to the Bay of Fundy in New Brunswick, I can't recommend it enough. It is amazing. You can walk around on the beach at low tide and there are these mushrooms sprouting up from it that are little islands at high tide. It's literally a pillar of rock that gets wider at the top and has trees and grass and all kinds of plants growing on it. That is how big the tides are. So incredible. Go check it out. <laughs> A lot of us are super excited about the shellfish we see, Michelle and I both harvesting it. And Greg is saying, these are gonna be good bait, but dang, what I really need is fish. And that's a good point because shellfish is awesome, but it's really high in protein and really low in fat, whereas fish has a lot of fat. So definitely not a bad call to be using the mussels as bait rather than as food, but he's having a real hard time fishing. And that's a thing you, we tend to assume that coastal locations are going to be good fishing, but it's so location dependent. And like Greg, I had rocks that were forming kind of a, a barrier reef, not a reef, but rocks just off the little beach I was on. And you can see some of the rocks sticking out of the water. So like him, I had nowhere where I could cast into actual deep water. Oh my goodness, losing your cooking pot. I'm just feeling all of his stress as he is looking around for that. In normal life, oh, a lost pot, maybe not that big a deal. Out there, when you have so little, your pot is truly your lifeline because that water, you do not 
want to drink the water from that place. It depends. Each site is different. It's possible that maybe had a place with springs, but when you're out that far towards the coast and you're close to sea level, then it's not like there's big mountains catching the fresh water and funneling it down towards you. So a lot of the water is going to be in lakes and bogs. You do not want to drink that water without purifying it. So it's not just he can't cook, he can't harvest. It would be that he can't drink water. <laughs> and obviously you're not going to live very long without fresh water. So losing his cooking pot, such a big stressor. And this brings me to something that's really important to think about on a loan. You have to be so careful, like ridiculously careful with all of your gear, with all of your items, all of your clothing. You have to completely reorient the way that you function in normal life and being absurdly aware of where you put everything down and checking a million times that it's still there so you don't lose something really, really key. And this is a great illustration of that because he finds his pot. So it's not the end of the world, but that time when he thinks he's lost his pot and what that means to his time out there, really visceral, the stress load he's under, right? And then you see me at my spot and you can see that it is mostly barren rocks. And most of the trees that we have are very, very scattered tamarack trees. Now, tamarack, AKA larch is really different than firs and spruces. Tamarack is, while it's a conifer, it's not evergreen. It is the only conifer that loses its needles. So this is a not just something to pay attention to on the landscape, makes the landscape feel a lot more daunting because it's just barren as opposed to seeing greenery in the background. The trees look skeletal. But it's not just that. It's also that a lot of the game around there eats the spruce needles. It's basically the only resource for the game that's going to be living not in hibernation year round. So spruce grouse eat the spruce needles, rabbits, squirrels, they're all feeding on spruce. So when you have a location that is mostly tamarack, it means you have way less game. So this is where when I was watching a Mosa site and he had a lot of spruce and he has rabbits right away the first day, I'm like, oh my gosh, what I wouldn't have given for more spruce and fir rather than mostly tamarack. It just means it is a really, really barren resource poor area when you have mostly tamarack. This was an incredibly challenging location for me because I had ideas about shelter, not sure what I was going to do until I got on the site, but I had not planned for a spot that had almost no usable wood, you guys, so few trees. And that didn't just mean that there were less resources for me to use. It also meant that in building there, I was going to be having a massive impact on that landscape. And it's really important to me to tend wild space as well and be light on the land and be really respectful and reciprocal. So in the Arctic, I was able to thin the trees when I need to harvest. But out there, no, I just had to do what felt like devastating the landscape. So I tried to really think about how can I make the most useful shelter while having the least impact on this beautiful wild place. You heard me talking about tendonitis in my hands. That was a massive issue out there because it was such a challenging place to build. I was doing a lot of digging to make use of that natural corner of rock. Now that rock was to the north facing to the north and that was the predominant well, the wind came a lot from the east too, a lot, because of course that's facing the open ocean, but a lot of it was coming from the north and whipping up and over these ocean cliffs that were the main thing that I had to work with. And so having a rock to my north and my east felt really strategic, but it came with a ton of challenges. So I was doing a lot of digging and I was doing a lot of hauling rocks and the tendonitis from doing both of those things, plus being soaking wet and hypothermic combined with harvesting muscles, which is really intense on the hands, cranking those muscles off with just hand and finger strength meant that by day three and four, I was having a really hard time even using my hands, turning my headlamp on and off really hurt. It was intense. We then come to Greg who is sopping wet because his shelter is really, really leaking. So I'm going to be talking at the end of the review about canvas versus plastic tarp and some really critical differences between those. Both have huge advantages, huge disadvantages, and we're seeing that with Greg's experience right now. Completely miserable to have your down sleeping bag that wet and all of your gear that wet. 
huge issue for him. I feel like we're really seeing in this episode something I talked about in my last review. You're seeing it in all three of us out there and we're seeing it big time in Greg as he's so wet and it's reminding him so much of his time in Patagonia where the hypothermia from being really wet and cold and unable to warm up is what took him out. We are seeing serious PTSD. He is so triggered by how similar it is to last time and how much he's suffered last time. and. This is just an illustration of how different a second time is and how it's just impossible to go into it without it bringing up all of the things that were really challenging about your first time out. You're hearing it from everybody out there. This is so much harder than I expected it could ever be. It then flashes on a brief scene of me with my shelter talking about the holes that it already has from the time I took it out of the bag, but also just in the moving from my first temporary shelter that I slept in for two nights to the permanent shelter spot. Those tarps were just so thin that all I had to do was look at it or move it a little bit for it to pop holes. So I'm there with a shallow pitch in my roof and holes all over it. And that storm was so brutal, just like all the weather there is so brutal. And because I was just getting that shelter up during those first couple days of the big storm, I didn't have time to shore it up so that it wasn't going to have pools. And because of the holes, it was just leaking from each of those pools you see. I'll be talking more about the advantages and super challenges of that particular building spot again towards the end of this. We hear Greg talking about how little meat there is in a muscle. So true. You don't realize this unless you're really familiar with muscles, but looking at them, they look pretty substantial. The meat inside of those muscles is less than 10% of the space. That's mostly seawater, essentially. So when you cook them, they shrink down to this little bit of meat and a whole lot of empty space. That's why Greg is saying this is not very much food. Really cool seeing Greg making that trap on the beach. Greg is a trap master. You saw some footage of him showing us some of his own designed traps in the Before the Freeze episode. So would love to spend some time with Greg learning about all of his trapping tricks sometime in the future. Michelle on the beach harvesting mussels. We see how critical containers are for hauling stuff up. Brilliant idea for her to have sewn up her gaiters so she has a nice waterproof-ish harvest bag to get those mussels and clams that she's digging, which is amazing on home. Also, we see her digging with her bare hands. It was so cold out there. It is so hard on your hands in cold, wet temperatures to be putting your hands down in frigid seawater like that. So yeah, you're getting calories, but you're also costing your body calories by how much effort you have to put in and what a toll it takes on those hands. I think that working so hard and the cold conditions was a major factor of the tendonitis in my own hands I was experiencing at this time. Just the seizing up from the combination of those tendons being naturally less flexible in that cold and working them so hard, bad combo. Like Michelle, I was super obsessed with Laura Ingalls Wilder's books, all of the Little House on the Prairie books when I was a kid. and harvesting my own food and canning and all of the homestead arts bring me back to my childhood and how obsessed I was with all of those things at that time. I also thought a lot about the book The Long Winter where the Ingalls family is slowly starving in a really harsh South Dakota winter when I was out on season six and it's part of what helped me get through the long hungry cold times on season six was being like hey one of my heroines went through the same kind of thing and she and her family survived it and so can I. We see Greg seeing his trap washed out by the high tides there. And this brings me to, now that I've seen everybody's location, how different my spot was than everybody else's. Everybody else seems to have a lot of shore. I had that one little beach and then high ocean cliffs everywhere else. It was serious effort for me to get down to my beach. I had to scale massive elevation and walk across a ton of barren rocks just to get to that little beach. Everybody else seems to have low elevation, more or less sea level, and a ton of shore to harvest from. At the end of this episode, you can just see how much all three of us are struggling. Michelle with her belly, me with hypothermia and the hands and homesickness and just being soaking wet for so long. Greg with PTSD and being soaking wet and hypothermic. It was so much harder than any of us had bargained for by a long shot. 
it was fun seeing just the little snippets from the next episode because uh yeah i wasn't sure if they would show it but pepper spraying myself in the face in the night that was that was a moment for sure <laughs> So let's talk about the difference between canvas and plastic tarps. One crucial difference we are seeing here, which is that canvas is woven material. So it's actually full of holes. So if it is flat or if water is pooling in it, it is going to leak. And that's what we're seeing with Greg. It's also way, way stronger and more resilient than plastic. So the plastic, totally waterproof, but it gets holes really easy. Canvas not waterproof unless you have it taut. So wonderfully waterproof when it's taut and when it has a good pitch. So the water just rolls right off of it. Also, it's less waterproof before it gets its first solid soaking. As those of us who have thrown a pair of jeans into the dryer and then had them come out too small to wear for a little while knows cotton shrinks when it gets wet and then it gets dry. So the first time your canvas gets wet and then dries again, it's gonna become more waterproof. It's gonna shrink and the holes in it get smaller. So for Greg, for his tarp to have gotten wet the first time out there, this is the leakiest that tarp is ever gonna be. And the fact that it's flat and has some pouches in it, it's not surprising to me that it's leaking right through. That's the nature of canvas. So that would be an awesome tarp for Greg if he hung it in a way that it was taut and that it had a nice pitch to it. One of the disadvantages to plastic is that it can burn easily. So sparks are going to burn a hole through your tarp in no time. Whereas canvas, it would burn eventually, but it's going to take a lot longer and you're going to tend to notice it. So positives and drawbacks of each, but it's the way that that one is strung that is making it such an issue for Greg out there. All right, so a few tidbits of backstory. What you are seeing is my first day and me scouting the land. I took a day and a half to scout. Day two was beautiful and I took the time to get a fire going, get some water purified for myself so I had a full pot plus that lovely water bottle full and also to cook a pot of food. So day two, I had a huge pot full of mussels. It was amazing. In the Arctic, I didn't eat food until two weeks in. So to have a full belly on day two was incredible. It was hard to take that time because I knew the storm was coming, but because I wasn't going to go until the storm without drinking water, I had to start a fire and get water cooking anyway. So it was a no brainer to go ahead and make up that pot of food. Scouting day one and day two, I was looking for an area for my permanent shelter that was going to be sheltered. It was going to have good access to the fresh water, good access to building materials and relatively close to the shore and to hunting grounds. Guess what? They're just weren't any. And the building materials were so few and far between. I was picturing, how am I going to build with this? I'm going to have to clear cut this whole area. And there still probably isn't enough building material. And the wind was so ferocious. So those three issues, not having very much building material, needing it to be really sheltered and not wanting to be too far from at least fresh water, were why I chose the location I did tucked into rocks. That had some great advantages, nice shelter from the really gnarly prevailing winds, but it was so hard to build into it because of course the rock surface was not even, it was all uneven. And then it meant that my tarp wasn't big enough to build with very much pitch because my spot was already low by nature of the rock itself. And so if I pitched below it, then I was going to have almost no space in there. So I chose to pitch a little bit above the rock so I could almost stand up in parts of it. But what that meant is very shallow pitch to that roof, which is really hard when you have a lot of intense rain and you see that. Also, that storm came in and I was just having to work on that shelter out in the storm all day. I didn't have much choice because I had to get that at least to where it wasn't going to be leaking like crazy on me and to where my stuff could stay dry. So three days of just working my butt off, hauling heavy rocks and digging and hauling trees from far away because there just weren't many close just destroyed my body and my hands. Another thing you don't see is that it wasn't just the tendonitis I was dealing with. I got this crazy, weird thing happening on my toe that was incredibly painful. I had no idea what it was. 
it was probably day four or five that I woke up in the night having a dream that someone was sawing my toe off. The pain was so intense. It turned from red and swollen and really painful to a huge, like greenish, gnarly blister full of infected pus, limping, soaking wet and hypothermic, barely able to use my hands. That's why I am having such a rough time on that clip of me day six, just not enjoying my time out there. I wasn't expecting that. I loved every minute of my time on season six. I thought I would be as in love with the experience in Labrador as I was on season six, but that wasn't my experience. So this episode ends with three people who look like they're in rough shape. And I was one of them, <laughs> so I remember it well. Really excited to share more with you as we go on through the Alone Frozen series.